Three, 503. Let's stand. 503, since Jesus came into my heart. We'll sing the first and last. What a wonderful Good singing. Thank you. you. May be seated. Amen. Well, would you turn with me tonight to 1 Samuel chapter 16? Thanks for being patient with me as I went through that list of items. As I was on stage and after I was done speaking about it, there's one more thing that I forgot to mention. Uh, we also want to see the parking lot sealed this summer. So that's something else. As you can tell, the parking lot's got some age on it. It's fine. It's in good shape, but it it definitely has some spots that could be filled in, and so pray for us about that. Uh, we want to get it all resealed and maybe add a little more to the maybe some of the little potholes or little cracks that need it. Give some special attention there. Yes. That's a good question. I didn't even write down Vacation Bible School. I would like to see VBS, and um, we'll hopefully have an announcement about that in a few weeks. I just want to make sure that if, if we're doing VBS, if there's anything that we're supposed to do and follow and that kind of thing. So I would like to junior, see junior camp in July, VBS in June. And if we are doing it in June, then we'll have to be on it quick and get word out about that. So we'll see. Uh, but I'd like, to, I'd like to see it done. And uh, let's, let's ask God for wisdom in that as well. 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter number 16. We are going to begin a journey tonight, and it's going to be an exciting journey. Uh, Brother Purcell joked around this evening as I came in. He said, so are you going to preach a 62-part series on why I should love and support my pastor? And uh, I said, you know, that's a good idea. Maybe I should do that. And uh, no, it might not be six. It might be 62 parts. Okay, I'm just joking. I don't think it'll be that long. But it will be a journey about David, about David and this man in the Word of God that much is written about. Consider this with me. David's name is mentioned 1,127 times in the Bible. Uh, by comparison, Paul, okay, Paul is mentioned 163 times. A handful of chapters are given to Abraham and Joseph but 54 chapters at least, and you could really say 66 if you added parts of others, uh, 66 chapters in the Word of God are committed to David. What's unmistakable is that God has placed an emphasis on David in his life. And if the Lord has placed that kind of an emphasis on it, I believe we should place an emphasis on it. I told my children as we were driving in, as Trent was driving in, can you believe that? He drove us all tonight into church. And uh, so while he was driving, I took the time to address the family. And I said, I want all of you paying attention tonight. I want you taking notes. And uh, really, uh, this might take us several months. We might be well into the summer or the fall by the time we end this series or even beyond. But this is a tremendous a tremendous account in God's Word. I don't think you'll find more exciting reading uh, than you will on the life of David in God's Word. By far, God's done some of his greatest work in my life as I've been reading through David's life. 
Uh, as I got my heart right with God as a senior in high school, I was in the middle of reading about King David. Uh, it was in the Life of David class that I took in college that the Lord really did some things in my heart and did some things in my life. And uh, I believe Heather and I took that class together. It is a wonderful, wonderful story about a man who is just like us. And I mean that, he was just like us. He's not a superhero. Uh, he, he, he didn't wear a large D on his chest for David and have a cape. He was a normal man. But here's what he was. He was a man after God's own heart. And this is why I believe this series is so helpful and it's so relevant to us as we study David's life. Because in David's life, I believe we see the heart of God. So let's pray and uh, let's... Let's look into the scripture. Father, help us tonight as we see uh, the beginning of this story of a man that you used in a wonderful way, that you've placed an unmistakable emphasis on. Now, he was just a man, and Lord, you, you make that clear. He had some failures, some great failures. And Lord, he, he made mistakes. But he was a man who was after your heart, and when he made mistakes, he got up again and continued forward. I pray that we would have that same approach. Help us to see the beginning, uh, Lord, of how he's mentioned in Scripture here tonight. And we'll trust you to guide us as we begin. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. There the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. This is a wonderful story of a wonderful man of God. In it, we see the prophet Samuel. As a matter of fact, the name of these books are Samuel, because it begins with Samuel. Samuel was a tremendous prophet in the word of God, used of God to see great things done in Israel's history. And not only was he a great prophet, but he also judged Israel for a period of time. And after he was judged, we see that his sons uh, followed in his footsteps in leadership, but they did not have the same kind of heart that Samuel had. As a matter of fact, you can turn back with me to 1 Samuel chapter 8. And there the Bible says, in verse 1, And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old. That's a hard truth to deal with, isn't it? Thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. That was even more difficult for Samuel to deal with. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. This is an important point in Israel's history. Samuel judged, and he judged righteously. He was a righteous prophet. But when he became old and he handed over the leadership to his sons, unfortunately, they did not follow in his footsteps. They did not have the same heart that their dad did. And the Bible says that they went after lucre. They were more concerned with getting bribes and what was in it for them. And they utilized even what should have been the spiritual aspect of the temple to increase themselves in a financial way. 
they were men who didn't seem to love God or didn't care about the things of God as Samuel did. And we can learn some things from this. The first thing is this. Any of us could have children that don't live for God like we do. And, and nobody is exempt from that. Samuel, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, Samuel, a man who God greatly used, still had sons that did not follow in his path. And I would encourage us to pray for the next generation. And I would warn any of us not to grow too haughty or to think that we have it all together or that those who we've raised are going to ex do exactly as they should do because after all, they're our children. No, not at all. We all need to have a humble spirit and say, Lord, capture the heart of my sons and my daughters and may they go in your ways. I'd ask that you pray for my children. I I'm looking at them tonight. I'm, I'm asking that God would get a hold of their, their hearts, every single one of them. And that they would follow not after just mom and dad, but more importantly, that they'd follow after God. I want that for my four. I want that for, I, I want that for everyone. Every child that's here tonight, every young person that's here, I want to see them follow after God. But we understand that people do make their choices, and we might have adult sons or daughters that don't choose the path of the Lord. Even Samuel dealt with that. Samuel had to face that. And if you're facing that tonight, I would encourage you to know that even the prophet Samuel had to deal with this. What do we do? Well, we keep praying for them, don't we? We keep bringing them before God. We keep trusting God to get a hold of their life and to get a hold of their heart. David was a man after God's own heart. If you'll turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. We fast forward from that time where Samuel's sons did not judge righteously to now where the kingdom of Israel is ruled by a king, no longer by judges. The reason for that was because the judges pulled, they pulled Samuel aside and said, you're old and your sons are wicked. And we don't want judges anymore. We want a king. Israel begged God, or Israel, Israel begged Samuel for a king. And so Samuel did the right thing. He went to God and said, Lord, they're asking for a king. And the Lord said, listen to them. He said, it's not been my desire to give them a king. But give them a king and warn them about what a king will do. And Samuel did that. Samuel said, a king is going to take from your sons and daughters. A king's going to take uh, from what you have. That The king's going to take what God's given you and utilize it uh, for himself and for his own purposes. And uh, a king is not my original decision. But if you want a king, I'm going to give you a king. And you'll find out that maybe it wasn't the best idea to have a king. We fast forward now all the way to this point in time in 1 Samuel chapter 13, years later after their first king has been chosen, and that king was King Saul. I don't have the time to develop all of what happened with King Saul, but King Saul started as a great king, and he looked the part. He was tall and he was handsome. And if you were to look at a man and say, that's a king, Saul fit the description. But Saul was unique, and not only did he look the part, but he, he started with a humble heart. He was little in his own sight. And he, he sought after God, and he sought after the Lord. But remember something, it's not just how we begin our race, it's how we finish. And we might start great, we might start well. Uh, there's people that have started their race well, but they've not finished well. Saul was one of those, unfortunately. And Saul became consumed with envy, he became consumed with insecurity. He, he became consumed with receiving the credit and receiving what he believed he should receive. And rather than deflecting back to God, he became focused on self to the point that he even became outright disobedient. And when Samuel gave Saul the directive, the, the commandment from God to utterly and completely destroy the Amalekites, he did to a point, but he didn't follow all of what had been commanded. And he saved back the livestock and he saved back the king and his life. And because he disobeyed in that way, in a very direct way, he had the kingship 
removed. However, it wasn't removed right in that instance. But it was declared and made clear that because he disobeyed in such a dramatic way and in such a, a blatant way, now the Lord was going to choose someone else. And that's where we look in 1 Samuel chapter 13, where the Bible says, And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. You can imagine that this was difficult not only for Saul, but it was difficult for Samuel. Remember, Samuel and Saul kind of came up together. Samuel had the great privilege of anointing Saul the first time and being the one who was instrumental in seeing Saul chosen to be king. And, and the Lord used Samuel in that way. And, and initially Saul listened to Samuel and they they helped to lead Israel in a right way following after God. Uh, but now he was disobedient. And we begin now in our reading here in 1 Samuel chapter 16, and Samuel's just in the dumps. He's grieved. He's grieved for a number of reasons. The nation is in the midst of a tragic time because of the king's disobedience. His own sons have not followed after him. And you might think someone like Samuel could get bitter in this place. I'm glad he didn't. But understandably, he was grieved. His man Saul, he didn't pass the test. His own sons, they, they weren't following after God. And they were using the position they had for filthy gain. And Samuel probably thinks to himself, Lord, I, I feel like I've done everything I've, I'm supposed to do. From the time I was a boy, I listened to your calling. Remember when he heard him call upon him when he was just a boy? He heard Samuel, Samuel, and, and he went and said, I hear someone calling me. And the priest said, go back and go back. And finally he said, listen, and it was the voice of God calling upon Samuel. Samuel was a promised son to begin with. Hannah wasn't able to have children, but then God blessed Hannah with a child, Samuel. And this Samuel grew in to be a great prophet. And when you read of Samuel's life, he was just a God-fearing, God-loving man who seemed to always try to do things the right way. And yet still he's facing some real difficulty at the end of his life. And it's tragic for him. And you know what? It also reminds us of something. We're, we all face difficult times, and they might not even be due to our own doing. What do we learn in all of this? And here's the Here's the gist of the whole message tonight. God has a plan. God has a plan. Samuel had a hard time seeing right then that God had a plan. He felt like his life was coming apart at the seams, didn't he? But God said something else. And I love what he says to him in verse 1. How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine own horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king amongst his sons. God has a plan. That's the first thought. We must never fail to remember that God is sovereign. And because God is sovereign, there he is, always in control of all that is happening. Now, it seemed to Samuel that things were out of control and that the nation was falling apart and his sons had gone awry and, and Saul was a completely different person now and his heart was not good like it started and he, he had wrong ulterior motives and it just seems like there's nothing going right. But all the while, God was in control. All the while, God was at work, and all the while, God's plan was intact, because he even said to him here, he says, I've provided me a king amongst his sons, the sons of Jesse. Samuel didn't see that until God told him. But while it seems like things aren't going well, God's over there visiting the house of Jesse, and he's looking amongst Jesse's sons. And he sees someone who captures his attention because he sees in this young man his own heart. And he says as much 
to the prophet Samuel. There I have provided me a man after my own heart. And with this man, with a single man that had the heart of God, we see really the entire course of human history being directed in a certain way. Remember something. We sometimes think that there's no hope when really, if we just saw as God saw, there's great hope. And if we could just understand as God does, oh, he's working behind the scenes and he knows exactly what he's going to accomplish. I know that we can get our eyes on what's happening around us and we can say to ourselves, well, things are bad and boy, the country's going in a terrible direction and there are people that are in control right now that do not uh, have God's heart. And that's true. I believe that the majority of people that are in control in our country right now do not have the heart of God. But what I'm thankful for is that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And so they might not have God's heart, but God might have their heart whether they want it or not. And God does direct and God moves. And uh, we, we have to be mindful of the fact that God is in control and God is sovereign. And even when things don't seem to go very well, we can trust that God is in control and that God has a plan. And Romans 8.28 is still true. He works all things together for good to those of us who know and love God. I believe that tonight. And right now, there might be some difficulty in your life. It might be a physical difficulty. It might be you're just observing the state of things, the state of our country, the state of our culture, the state of our churches, the state of this virus or whatever it is. And you might be coming a little discouraged. I, I would encourage you tonight, don't get your eyes too fixated on all that's happening around you. And certainly don't get your eyes fixated on what everyone is saying. Because what really matters is what God has said and what God is doing. So let's read the Word of God more than we're reading social media. Because all it takes is just a few people on social media who don't have the right heart and don't have the right spirit, who aren't at all paying attention to what God has said or even striving to see what God's doing, and their bad spirit can rub off on you real quick. And all they want to do is complain. And all they want to do is just talk about how terrible things are. All they want to do is just speak about these things and post about these things. And what really matters is not what they're saying, but what God has said and what God is doing. Let's get our heart and our mind in the right place. Let's read God's Word more than we're reading anything else. God help us to do that. We see... Three times in verse 1, God says, I. Two times in verse 3, he says, I. I think all Samuel could think about was me, Saul, my own terrible situation. And God says, stop mourning and think about not yourself for a minute, but I and what I'm going to do. Because I'm going to do something great. Psalm 31 and verse 15 tells us, My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. Just remember that our times are in God's hands, and he can deliver us from anyone he wants to, and he can deliver us to anyone that he wants to. He can deliver us into bondage if that's his will. I'm not looking for that. I'm not signing up for that. But if God wills that, God will do what God will do, and we will accept what God will do. And just as soon as he can deliver us into bondage, he can deliver us right out of bondage. The point is, God is doing something. And if you believe God, and you believe that he's real, we trust that he is doing much that we can't see. Listen, God begins something long before men ever see the evidence of it. He rejected Saul and he chose David, but it was all part of God's plan. He sees the unseen and it's evident that he is constantly looking into and searching the hearts of men. Before Samuel even realized, perhaps even who Jesse was, God was looking into the heart of his son. If we desire God with all of our heart, he can find us, and he can bless us, and he can use us. God has a plan. And my, my, my thoughts are going quickly tonight because I don't have much time. But secondly, we don't know all of God's plan at once. 
This is what the Lord says to Samuel. He simply says to him in verse 3, Call Jesse to the sacrifice, and, show, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. Isn't that good? He said, here's what I want you to do. Take a heifer, go to Bethlehem to the house of Jesse, and as you get there to the house of Jesse, uh, I want you to perform the sacrifice, but, but you just go there, and I'm going to show you what you're supposed to do when you get there. The Lord rarely gives us the whole kit and caboodle all at once. We couldn't handle it if he did. But what he does do is he says, you go this far, you obey me here, and I'll show you the rest of the way. You know, earlier in my ministry as pastor, I, I, I got my, the cart above uh, or in front of the horse often, and I would try to get the whole kit and caboodle all in one, in one shot. You probably saw that in some of the uh, in, in some of the vision nights that I had, I would say, here it is, here's what's going to happen, this is what's going to take place. And now the Lord has shown me, just, you can have a vision, but trust me for every step of the vision. Because I will show you, and you go as I lead, and you trust me, and you follow me as I show you the way that you're supposed to go. And tonight, there might be some of you that you're in the midst of something, and you don't see it all right now. Would you keep looking to God and trusting Him? He'll show you. Young people tonight, maybe you're in the midst of something. Maybe you're not sure exactly what the rest of this year is going to hold. And you're not sure, sure if you're going to uh, get a job. And you're not sure when you'll uh, get your license. You know, whatever it might be. Just keep following God. Keep taking little baby steps. And, and God will show you the rest of the way. I, I've shared this with Trent as I've t had talks with him from father to son. Uh, we sometimes want to get, get in our mind the full picture and understand it all. But what I've encouraged him to do, and, and I'll continue to have these talks with my other children, is you, you focus on what you can do now, and you dedicate yourself to that, and God will show you the next step. And God will show you the next step. And we can't get bogged down with how the steps went wrong in the past, and we can't get concerned about why it, the, the steps didn't go like we thought they would. What we need to do is say, the Lord, Lord uh, that's behind me, this is in front of me, you take me where I need to go, and you continue to show me what I need to do. That's all Samuel needed to worry about. Just listen to God. Just follow me. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Neither are his ways our ways. I love Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. We don't know all that God has planned for us, and we shouldn't, because he has not designed our lives that way. It was Jesus who said, take no thought on the morrow. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You listen, you obey, go do what I've said, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. As we look further ahead into our life, we have to always keep this perspective. Because we might say to ourselves, I don't know what to do if this happens. You ever think that way? Some of you planners probably think that way, don't you? You're, any planners here? You're a big planner, okay? And you might say to yourself, well, A, B, or C could happen. I think I know what to do if A happens, but if B or C happens, I'm, I'm sunk. And, you, and we can think that way. And we can say, I don't know what to do if this takes place, and I'm not sure how it's going to go if this happens. But remember something, you might not know now, God will show you then. And he always does. And you're not probably even prepared now to know what you would do then. I, I love this phrase, we'll see. We'll know what to do as we get there. I I've learned to say that more with my family, trying to get an answer real quick. Hey, can we do this? Hey, can we put this down? Can you sign in blood that this is going to happen on this day? Dad, come on. Honey, come on. Are we going to do this? Let, let, let's get it in writing. Let's seal it. And sometimes I've made the mistake of, okay, yeah, we'll do it. And then, and then we can't do it. But what I've learned to say a lot of is, we'll see. And they don't like that answer as much. But it's a good answer because we, we will see. We, don't, we might not know now, but we'll see as we get there. And that's an exciting way to live. I don't want to know everything right now. <laughs> I just want to know what God has for me in this moment and today. Because 
after today is tomorrow, and tomorrow will have its own set of challenges and circumstances. And here's the last thought, and that's this. His plan is always best. We might not understand his plan, but his plan is always best. So I'm not going to uh, preach on this fully right now, but Samuel obeys and he listens and he does go and he meets the elders of Bethlehem and they go down to the house of Jesse together. They're a little concerned when they see the prophet show up. Are, are you coming in peace? You feel that way when the pastor calls? Are you calling in peace? <laughs> Sometimes I'll call people. Everything all right? Wait, what's, what's the matter? You know? <laughs> Everything's all right. Just I, I have a thought I want to share. But, but the Lord directed Samuel in this way and he said peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. It almost seems to Samuel that he does know what God's doing as soon as he gets there because out of all the sons, Eliab was the man. And without getting too deep into this, we'll learn next week, Eliab wasn't the man. And Samuel was confused and probably wanted to throw his hands up in the air. I listened to you. Did what you said. I got the heifer. I brought the heifer down and I met the elders of Bethlehem and we went to the house of Jesse. And thank you, Lord, for showing your will. Eliab, he is the, he is the man. He is the the Tom Brady of his generation, all right? Some of you probably hate hearing me say that. I don't know. He looked the part. He looked the part. I mean, he had it all together. And if there was anyone that was going to lead, he was it. The only problem was it wasn't God's plan. And I'm glad it wasn't God's plan because God's plan is always right. Now, does God use the ones who looked the part? Sure, he does. But he's not locked in just to the people who look the part. You see, God can and often does use anybody that he so chooses. Whether they look the part and many times when they don't look the part. We understand that God is involved in using people who are often not thought of and overlooked. The Bible tells us that, that not many great, not many noble are called. Some of the men I've looked up to the most in life... Some of the ones I've learned most from are men who would describe themselves as overlooked people. <clears throat> My own pastor, I, I might ask him to share a little bit of his personal testimony when he comes to preach for us in, in April. But he tells a story about how <laughs> God called him to preach and he went to Bible college. And he was so excited about, and I, I hope I'm telling this right, he was so excited about finally preaching his first sermon in, in homiletics. And he preached that first sermon for the professor in his homiletics class. And I think he preached on 12 aspects of the personal priesthood of the believer. And he loved it. It just so happened that the professor and the rest of the class didn't love it so much. To the degree that when he was done finally preaching on the 12 aspects of the personal priesthood of the believer... The professor looked right at him and said, Mike, there's a lot of ways we can serve God other than pastoring and preaching. After he was told that by his professor, he went to his job, which was at a junkyard. That, that's the way he was providing. And he was married and I believe had at least one child at this point. And he went to the junkyard to work. And at the end of his work that evening, he got laid off from his job at the junkyard. And he didn't even have his own, his wife had to drop him off to work. And so I believe, is, if, if I have the story right, he sat on his lunch pail after having just gotten laid off from his job at the junkyard and having just heard from his homiletics professor that he probably wasn't going to make it as a pastor or a preacher. And he was just as low as he could be. But God turned the whole situation around and, and I've got to tell you, to me, he means so much personally and how he's had influence in my life. And you want to talk about a preacher. <laughs> oh, he is a preacher. God's used him. And 
It's been, it's been exciting to see God use a single person dedicated to the Lord in that way. I think of men like Dr. Charles King. Dr. Charles King sat on my ordination. He's, in the, he's involved in Bible translation. He's in his 80s now. He might even be close to 90. Uh, but, but for years, uh, he was a, a tremendous pastor down at, I, I think it's the First Baptist Church of Milford in Milford, Ohio. But when he first went to that church, it was just a small little band of people. And Dr. Dallas Billington of the Afro Baptist Temple was involved in sending preachers out left and right to see churches started all over Ohio or to take small little uh, fledgling churches or churches that were falling apart and to send preacher boys out. And he said that Dr. Dallas Billington looked at him and said, you're not much at all. But this little group of people down outside of Cincinnati, they're not much either, so it might just be a good match. He said, get on down there and see what you can do. And he went down there, and he said, well, I went down there, and God did an incredible work and blessed us and grew the church, and not long after, Dr. Dallas Billington died. And Dr. Dallas Billington was a great man of God, but he realized, I don't, I don't put my confidence in man and what he says. It's always in what God says and what God wants to do. And he went down there, and God used him in a great way. And then after that, the Lord's used him continuing uh, on to see Bibles translated. He grew up in some of the roughest sections of Ohio. Uh, he, he, was, he grew up in the project, so to speak. And to see what God's done with his life has been incredible. One, pers- one couple that my wife and I just love, and it's the reason why you see them here a lot, is Toby and Rita Weaver. It's no mistake if you've been here for any amount of time. We just love that couple. And, and here's why. I love his heart. If you just spend some time with Brother Weaver, he's got a heart of gold. And I believe has a heart that's after the Lord's heart. You can see it when he comes. You can see it when he ministers. You can see it when he preaches. He pastored some churches for a while, but the Lord's done some great work with him in Bible college ministry. And he talked to me a little bit about how he grew up in Lynchburg and how his family never had two pennies to rub together and how they were cast-offs. And thankfully, some people from Thomas Road Baptist Church sent a van or a bus to go pick up he and his brothers. And he said he and his brothers were unruly to begin with, and they were unruly in the church, but they, the church just loved them and didn't give up on them. And, and God's used his life to touch many, many people for the Lord. He's well into his 70s now, and he's beat cancer and other physical ailments, but he, he comes to our church at least once a year, and he preaches truth, and he's investing in young lives. I, I'm just simply saying this. God can and wants and will use anybody. You. Me, anyone, especially those who people have forgotten about and don't care much about. That's how David's story begins. Because in this initial meeting, we find out that David wasn't even thought of. (laughs) As a matter of fact, David wasn't even there. But that's exactly who God was going to use. He was by himself. And many times those who are cast off and who are forgotten about or not thought of and are by themselves, God is preparing to do some incredibly great things with. Will you remember that tonight? Will you just think about that this week? Because you might not be seen by many. You might be forgotten about. You might not be the one who people are talking about or preaching about or speaking about. You might not have your name uh, known. Oh, but I want to guarantee you something. If you're following after God with your heart, he knows your name. And that's all that matters. It's that God knows my name and that he knows your name and that he sees what's in here. We get all caught up in what's out here. God sees in. My question tonight is, what does God see in our heart? Would you pray with me? We'll end there. With heads bowed and with eyes closed, I, I want to ask, would you just come to the Lord tonight and 
even though you might not see it, recognize that God sees? Would you just trust that the Lord knows what's going on and the Lord knows what he's doing? And God has a plan? Maybe tonight you've gotten a little wrapped up in a lot of things that don't matter. Maybe you find your heart a bit discouraged. Samuel was right there. His nation was a mess. The king of the nation was a mess, and his heart was discouraged. His two adult sons were a mess, and his heart was discouraged. But God was not done with Samuel either. Oh, he's, he was going to use Samuel to do something incredible. And he was going to show him the way in which he would do it. And tonight, I, I don't know what mess you're facing. I don't know what's got you down. I'm not sure what only you can see. Would you just trust that God sees differently and God knows differently? And we can believe God and trust him to work his perfect will and his perfect timing? And even in your life, God is doing something great in the mundane, in the day-to-day, and in the unseen. But just understand, God sees the heart. And he's looking at your heart, even now. Lord, I want to come to you and I want to ask that you would help us with this message. Help us to understand that you see the heart. Lord, I want my heart to be your heart. I want my heart to follow after you. Lord, I, I want what you want. I don't want to be the kind of person that gets caught up in pleasing man or, or chasing the wrong things and the pride of life or the lust of the eyes or the lust of the flesh or what so many get caught up in. Lord, I, I want to follow you and you alone. I want what you want. May we all have that desire. And I pray that you would help us right now, help some people right now who might be in the midst of some discouragement who might not be able to fully see or understand what you're doing. and Help us now to know, Lord, that you'll show us what we need to do. Oh, we might not know right now, but you'll show us what we need to do then when the time comes. You'll give us the words to say. You'll give us the understanding. You'll give us the recall. Lord, you'll give us in that moment your grace to be able to face whatever it is. So we'll trust you for that. Help us to understand these things. Speak to us now and to your people in this invitation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? We're much later than we would be on a Sunday night, and that has to do with me sharing some of our vision for the year ahead. But I, I want to tell you something. A message like this is sobering to me because I get caught up in what only I can see. How about you? I'm going to ask God tonight to help me to, to just wait on him, trust him, and believe him and know that he's working. God has a plan. Amen? I'm going to ask Margaret to play for a verse or two of invitation. And maybe you come to the Lord tonight. I don't know. But let's ask the Lord to help us this evening. Take a moment and talk to the Lord.
thank you again for being here tonight, and thank you for being patient with me. We're usually done by 7 on a Sunday. I appreciate you being patient and waiting and uh, listening tonight. We'll look forward to continuing in this series on Sunday evenings. We'll be back again at the appointed time on Wednesday night. I hope to see you then. And again, uh, it's good to see Alton here. And how long are you around for? For a while anyway, huh? I don't know. He doesn't know. Okay. You'll know then, right? The Lord will show you what you need to do as you go forward. When he tells you, see, see me, I'm like, how long, how long is it going to be? How, how much time you got? You'll know as the Lord shows you. I'm glad that's, a, that's the right answer. Amen. Well, let's have a great night tonight and be dismissed and uh, uh, we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer now. And uh, I'd like to ask Brother Matt Purcell, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?